2015 Audi SQ5. It's tall, it's a baby buggy, but it has a lot of horsepower and a supercharger. Let's see what this thing has in store for us. So if you're familiar with the Audi lineup, specifically the A6 and A7, you know those can be spec'd with a three liter V6 that's supercharged that puts out 333 horsepower. This is a bit different. What they've done is they've played around with the boost a bit. So it's still the V6 and it's supercharged, but it puts out 354 horsepower at 6,000 RPM, stays flat to 6,500. The torque's changed as well. That's 346 pound-feet of torque, comes in at higher than I'd like to see, 4,000 RPM, stays flat to 4,500 RPM. Now the thing that I personally am rather excited about is how the engine is fitted to this car. Unlike the A3s we've been driving so much, uh, this, the engine is mounted this way as God intended. So what does all that translate to where the rubber meets the road? Because when I hear supercharger and V6 and 354 horsepower, I know I'm excited. So if we get out on a road like this, you, well, number one, you got to drive it a little bit more aggressively than other Audis because the torque comes in a little bit higher, but it doesn't mean that this thing's a slouch. Like, you know, you can throw this thing around a corner. I'm in second gear right now, and it can easily pull itself out of any kind of mess that you try to get yourself into. Granted, I'm not, I wouldn't push this as much as, say, I would push an RS7 because, you know, you're going to be prudent. You're driving a tall vehicle you got to take into account that there is a higher center of gravity. So even if you have all that power and torque, and really 346 pound-feet of torque, that is damn respectable. But this is where we get into personal preference, and this is a theme you and I are going to get into a lot in this episode. Um, would you put more than 354 horsepower on a vehicle like this? Me personally, I think this is about the limit because. At the end of the day, you, the dynamics of this vehicle are one for utility, even though it, this one is designed for performance. I think anything more than that, and you are just overtaxing the, the way the engineers, or really the platform of this vehicle. And let me give you a hint, Vice, here, in the Audi setup. And we will come back to that. So a little bit behind the scenes here, when we booked this, we booked it like almost on the same day as the Audi S8. And I'd love to sit here and tell you that we booked these because they're S models, but really it's just, we had driven so many Audis with transversely mounted engines. We wanted to get back to old school Quattro with engines mounted as going that way. Now, uh, while we're on that topic, in the Audi S3 film, there was a question uh, that I thought was an interesting question. What's the bias, front or rear wheel drive on the S3? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I too looked all over the internet, spoke to some folks at Audi, and there's no like published, hey, 67 here, 33 over here, or 50, 50. No one's published that. Um, but I can tell you from driving that car, it is very much a front wheel drive bias car, but it does a good job of throwing power to the rear wheels when you need it. Is it like what you get in that car and say, oh my God, this, I can't tell it from a rear drive car. No, you couldn't. But anyway, I digress. Back to the SQ5, and this is the gas tank here, just as I hit it here. Anyway, wanna point out a couple of things. So we've got that longitudinally mounted uh, three liter supercharged engine. That is bolted to an eight speed S-Tronic transmission, meaning you got your paddle shifts. And then, well, you got all that power, how do you stop it? We've got 13-inch rotors in the rear, 15-inch rotors in the front, which I'll point out, they got the SQ5 on the caliper here. And then uh, while we're here, let's take a look at the shoes or the dubs. Uh, these are 21 inches and they are fitted optionally. Now let's put aside that engine and unpack the transmission. This is the eight-speed S-Tronic you are so familiar with in other Audis. I would say in this scenario, it's not well matched. Like in an S8, it actually is very well matched. So for example, let's go into sport mode and let it do the shifting for us. So here's an instance where we've got a couple of tight turns here. 
and the car is in a much higher gear than I would uh, select myself and as a result I feel like I'm losing a little control to the point where I've got to scrub more speed because the transmission wants to be in a higher gear. Uh, that's what I mean by not beautifully matched. I think maybe if there was different mapping on this, uh, and, and while we're on that topic, let's transition into this drive select. So this one is fitted with a drive select that comes fitted as standard. Um, and that is, you're familiar with this with every other Audi film that we have uh, shared with you guys, where you've got four modes, you've got an automatic, you've got a comfort, you've got a dynamic, and you've got an individual. Love the individual modes. Uh, if you are not familiar with those, suggest you go back to our Audi S7 film and cover that in detail. But in this system, you can only change engine transmission, engine sound, and steering. So the suspension system, believe it or not, is not adjustable. I think that is an odd choice when you consider a vehicle that's very tall. Like if, I, if I'm gonna pay extra for the performance model, I would love to have the option to set up the suspension depending on how I want to drive. I think that's something that uh, Ingolstadt should revisit and at least offer on this car in the drive select system. Okay, so I will admit this is the go fast version of a sort of luxury uh, crossover mid-sized baby buggy, but it is an Audi, which means we gotta focus on the interior a bit because if you guys have been paying attention for the past, oh, I don't know, 15 years, Audi kinda knocks it out of the park with interiors, and this is really no exception. Let's break it down to a couple of points. Let's look at the design first. Really a very nice place to be, um, but if you look at current Audis, I feel two things. Number one, the design is getting a little bit dated. And number two, if you look at the fit and finish on the materials, fantastic. But look at the competition around them. Even like some Asian manufacturers, like Korean manufacturers, they're starting to catch up to these levels of build quality. So I kind of feel like Audi kind of needs to go back to the drawing board. Not that they've done anything bad here, it's just to make the next quantum leap for the next 15 years. Uh, and while we're talking about design, have you guys seen the new dash of the new TT, the instrument cluster in particular? That is kind of what I'm talking about. It is a huge step forward. That's what I'd love to see on the inside here. Now let's break it out into two other things. The Bang & Olufsen stereo, which is optional, but it's not the kicking system that we had over in the Audi S8. It doesn't have that same, you know, like, rock your intestines out kind of sound. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would get it in this car. And then let's talk about colors here. I, there's no way to say this nicely, but I hate the interior color of this car. Especially when you look at the materials. You got this beautiful uh, wood, but it's finished in black and it has this really unique aluminum trim inside and like inlays into the wood. You get that here, here, and here. We've seen this before on other Audis. We had it in that S7, but you can have it fitted with natural wood with the aluminum inlays. That combined with a different color inside here, I think would really make this a more pleasant place to be. Like, remember that S3 we had? That was the Sepang Blue or Sepang Blue, however you pronounce it. Imagine that with like a tan interior with like maybe a good saddle here and a lighter tan here. That would really pop with like the wood inlays or even if they were to go like red with like black and I don't know, maybe this gray here and then like carbon fiber here, you need, because it's so dark here and here, you need something to make it pop. Friends, we can't make it through this film without really talking about the elephant in the room and that is the Porsche Macan. Now, if you have been living under a rock or you've been the last to get the memo, the Audi Q5 and the Porsche Macan, they share the same platform, down to the wheelbase and suspension bits. And yeah, Audi has its own tuning over here and Porsche has its own tuning over here, but where I get confused is the things that are supposed to be separated more, like output, the real world performance, and especially dollars, what they ask for these two cars, they're so similar for a segment 
that is so small, and this is coming from two corporate cousins. So I don't know about you, but I'm confused. So I think we should spend some time talking about personality here. So now that we've brought up this whole M word thing, I feel like we need to set the table on the differences here. Yeah, we talked about the similarities and we talked about some of the differences, but it's amazing to me how, while these two are built off the same platform, the, the, the vehicles have such two completely different personalities. Like if I were to strap you in either one of these things and tell you that they're from two different companies, you would completely believe me. And that's because of the setup. And that's where we get to priorities and kind of we talked about that before. You know, you got a totally different engine, totally different transmission, and even the interior. I mean, you're talking about a vehicle that is the same platform, but this one is actually a little bit shorter and a little bit taller, which kind of defies the logic when you're trying to make a performance vehicle because you want it lower and wider, which is what the Porsche does. So think of it in this as a different way. We've got Porsche that started from a sports car to make a utility vehicle, and Audi started from a crossover to make a utility vehicle with performance. So put it yet another way, think of your US history when they connected the railroad cross country. They started on one side of the country in New York, and they worked until they caught up to the people that started on the other side of the country and somewhere met somewhere like what Colorado so I feel like Porsche they started in New York and they're like on the Kansas side of Colorado where Audi they're on the they're still in the Rockies they haven't quite met in the middle but they can kind of see each other they're close but the logic is still very much the same it's a sports car that's got some utility or do you want a utility vehicle it's got a little bit of performance In summary, what do we got? Well, for the first time in the history of our show here, we have a car that makes us dig down incredibly deep and ask us, just like your father did when he had the first heart-to-heart -heart conversation with you, what's important to you? What are your priorities in life? And that's exactly what this car asks you. Now, let me put it to you a different way. It is incredibly hard to buy a bad car nowadays. Now, is this car a bad car? Absolutely not. It is incredible what it can do and kind of defies physics. But really, the struggle or the question is, the platform that is used to build this is used to build an equally stellar or, depending on your viewpoint, more stellar vehicle, the Porsche Macan. So really the struggle is, you got a $62,000 car here, and I challenged myself, because I know you and I, we have this whole gag about the options on Porsches, but I challenged myself, could I build a Porsche that is the same price as this that I would want to drive? So I did just that. I went, I built one online, and I had to prioritize what's important to me. I did away with all the fancy stuff, and I focused on air suspension, I focused on PSM, and I had to have a sunroof, and you know me, I had to have a wood dash, and I was able to get a Macan, granted it was the base Macan, which is the closest in performance to this, uh, for the same $62,000. Which leads us to kind of a first. Like if you asked me which one I would choose, it would be so clear I would do the Porsche Macan. But that's me, that's what I think. So I'm gonna turn the question around to you guys. What would you buy given the choice? Because I personally think it's a huge function of personality. Do you like this design or do you like the design of the Porsche? Do you like the feel of the interior? Or really the transmissions are incredibly different. So let us know what you would choose and why you would choose it, and here's an important part of it, how you would option it. Like I focused on very expensive suspension, but nothing about fancy interior. So let us know in the comments below which one you would choose, why, and how you would option it, or via our social media, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And until next time, Auf Wiedersehen. So here's the script. Click here to subscribe. Click here to watch one of our 350 other episodes. And most importantly, share us with your friends. You're already wasting half your life on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Moto Man TV, all one word. I don't care who you share us with. Share us with your enemies. Just give the gift of Moto Man.